that beautiful song to start our worship. Welcome to worship today. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a couple of young adults that are wearing robes, and uh, this is Confirmation Sunday for us. Um, normally, we confirm our confirmands on Reformation Sunday, but this was an unusual year and a very special class of confirmands. So we get two for this service, two at the next service, and two at the last service, and we rejoice in being together with you for that. I uh, just want to announce that uh, we have our congregational meeting next Sunday at 1 o'clock. There's two ways you can attend. You can sign up online and attend here in person. We can have 93 people here in the sanctuary. And then if, if, <clears throat> if you sign up for Z the Zoom link, you can participate in our congregational meeting for the first time in the comfort of your own home. And they're also working on the way where there can be questions and answers and voting uh, through Zoom as well. So wonderful chance to check in and celebrate all that God has done for us as a church through this last year. I invite you to that next Sunday. Also want to just give a personal word of thanks for prayers and cards and so many ways that you've reached out to me and my family at the loss of my mom. Um, my sister and I left town really, really fast and we were able to get down to Santa Rosa in time to say goodbye to her. 
And then uh, we were on the verge of having to make the decision about life support, and she decided it was time to go home on her own. So we, we thank God for that, and, and we thank you for the, giving us the time and all the prayer and support. All right, I invite you to go ahead and stand up, and we're going to join in our beginning our worship songs. <laughs> You know, a lot of times when we say open up the heavens, we're wanting the heavens to open up that we can receive all that God wants to pour out on us. But this is our moment here when the heavens open that we can just praise God for who he is, not for what he can do, but for who he is and how we love him. So we sing, open up the heavens. We waited for this day. We gathered in your name, calling out to you. And your glory like a fire, awakening desire, would burn our hearts with truth. God, we stand in this place in this moment. God, because of you and who you are. God, because of all that you do, because of all that you are. God, because you first loved us. God, in response of love, we pour out words and emotions, Lord, that come from our heart. God, that you would open up the heavens, God, that we could see a little more of your glory. God, we could understand a little more of just how righteous and holy you are. So, God, we come to this altar. God, we lay down all that we think is ours. And we just worship you for who you are.
Are you hurting and broken within? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness is bought with precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Oh, bring your sorrow. seated. Our first reading today comes from the book of Jonah. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up and go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it a message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40, more, 40 days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Our gospel reading today comes from the gospel of Mark, the first chapter. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God. 
He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little further, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in the boat mending their nets. Immediately he called to them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of our Lord. Amen. Grace to and peace this day from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Today is one of my favorite days in the church year. Along with Christmas and Easter, I feel like this is a day we should be exceedingly excited for. Today we receive a gift in the affirmation of baptism. That gift comes in different parts. It comes by remembering our own baptism. It comes from the voice of our children. Man, do teenagers hate it when you call them children, right? As part of the right of affirming one's baptism, our confirmation students willingly and excitedly wrote statements of faith. Again, I'm getting an eye roll, at least from one of the confirmation students. Maybe not so willingly and not so excitedly, but they did write fantastic statements of faith. But before we get to that, I want to talk about these two passages just a bit. Because we begin today in our reading from Jonah. Jonah is such a great story, isn't it? It's one of the first stories that we teach our children. God calls Jonah to go to Nineveh. He has a very specific message for this faithful servant. He calls Jonah to go to Nineveh to tell the people that he will destroy them. Now, Jonah has two problems with this request from God. First, he hates the Ninevites. I mean, there's just no kind way of saying it. Jonah hates the Ninevites. And so he wants nothing to do with delivering a message, even a message of destruction to the people of Nineveh. And so as we know the story well, Jonah hears God's demand. Good and faithful Jonah listens to what God is speaking to go to Nineveh, and instead he goes to Tarshish. Because isn't that sometimes what we do? When we hear God calling us to move in a certain direction, when we hear a clean, clear message of this is what God wants us to do, sometimes we, don't we turn around and go the other way? Now, we, this is a story we love, isn't it? We teach it to our children. We love the way it's illustrated. Jonah has to learn a hard lesson in the soft belly of a whale. And when he finally has this opportunity to hear this message again, that's where we pick up in our text today, he goes the way God demanded. But now, like I said, Jonah had two problems with this. First, he didn't want to go to Nineveh. But when he arrived to Nineveh, and we read that the city is so vast it takes three days to walk across, he's only one day into his journey, and he's delivering this message of destruction and judgment. And immediately, we read immediately, the Ninevites repent from their sin. They fast and they put on sackcloth and they turn away from their behaviors and they turn back to God. And God relinquished from his judgment. See, that was Jonah's second problem, wasn't it? The love and grace of God was a problem for Jonah. Not for Jonah because it had delivered him from the, whale, the belly of a whale, but it was for the people who, for whom he hated he knew that God was loving and gracious and merciful. And he knew that if the people responded, he would relent from punishment. Immediately following this passage in the next chapter of Jonah, four, chapter 4, Jonah has this, this sacred fit with God. That's why I like to call it a sacred fit. Have ever, you ever had a sacred fit with God? He says to God, I knew you were gracious and compassionate. You were slow to anger and abounding in love. And he's angry. I knew you were going to forgive them. I knew you were going to be just with them and exceedingly loving. I knew you were going to be a God who relents from sending calamity. And in Jonah's anger, his faithful anger, he asks God to end his life. It's hard to let go, isn't it? 
Isn't it hard to let go to a God who wants something from us? Jonah didn't want to deliver a message he knew that God would lovingly change if God were to see his people repent. He wanted destruction for this people that he hated. And even though God had given this incredible grace to him, he just couldn't see it for those others. Isn't that sometimes hard for us as well? Isn't it hard to let go and let God be in charge? Let God be the judge. Let God be the one who gives abundant grace and mercy and love. So also we turn to our gospel text. Jesus has a message that echoes John. Repent and believe for the kingdom of God is near. In fact, the kingdom of God was standing right before them, wasn't it? Here is the Son of God delivering a message of the one who would tear the curtain in two. This is the one who would wake the dead, who would bring full, full, fulfillment of life to all of God's people. Jesus is moving across the countryside proclaiming, here he is for all. And as he comes across some fishermen, Simon and Andrew, working in their modest fishing business, he invites them, follow me. Follow me and I will help you to do the work for the kingdom that is familiar. I will help you to be fishers of men. And again, he meets John and James, brothers of Zebedee. This is the competition, isn't this? If you have two small fishing enterprises on the same lake, you have the competition. And Jesus says the same invitation to them, come and follow me. We read that immediately they left their, <coughs> their father and his workers in the boat as they were mending the met nets. Now I think about what this must have looked like. The boat kind of embanked into the shores of the Sea of Galilee. They would have literally jumped out into the water to run up and meet Jesus. I sometimes wonder, is it, is it because those who they knew well, Andrew and Peter were with her, Andrew and Simon were with Jesus? What was it about this interaction? But they immediately jump out of the boat and they follow him. Jesus, his invitation is wonder, of wonder and excitement. Now there's a hierarchy in the ancient world. Fishermen ranked significantly low from that of rabbis. In fact, as a young boy, you would desire to sit at the feet of the rabbi. That was the best job. Take note, to be a pastor is a good job. That still exists. In the hierarchy of the ancient world, to be a rabbi was a great job, but if you were not smart enough, if you could not retain the information, if you had a roughness, maybe you weren't from the right pedigree, you were dismissed to one of the lower classes, and a fisherman, a fisherman was about par with a carpenter. It was a rougher way of earning a living. So here we see Jesus standing on the shores in his seamless tunic. He's coming to the shores and he's inviting these men. I wonder if some, some of their anticipation, their excitement of following Jesus is that they were receiving an invitation to move up in status. Maybe they saw in Jesus an easier way of life. Follow him and things could be better. Do we ever do that? Do we ever think if we just follow God, if we follow Jesus' command, if we tend to our lives and we do all of the fulfillment of the law to the best of our ability, we think somehow life is going to be easier. But here's what I love about this metaphor of fishing. It always gets me, right? Jesus invites the disciples to come and follow me. I will make you fish for men, for all people. But even in the greatest catch, even in the most excitement, with the largest of fish, the fish has to die, doesn't it? To follow Jesus, to catch fish, is that life as you know it ends. Think about that. In all of the glory of a good catch, including the reality that when the catch comes to shore, the fish exist no more as they once were. 
Jesus is inviting these men now to catch people into a new way of life. He's inviting them to see a new understanding of God's kingdom. He's inviting them to know that God's kingdom is about to break through in a way they didn't expect and they might not know how to embrace. And here he is to teach them exactly what that's all about. And the only way to do that, the only way to do that is to die to this world. Die to a world and the comforts of it. To die to the world and the rhythms and the conveniences of what we think life is all about. The only way to respond to Jesus and be fishers of all people is to die to what this world says and is right and wrong and submit to the one who is judge of all. It is to die to the sin and the brokenness and find a new hope in believing that God has something better for us, a new kingdom here on earth as it is in heaven. That's what baptism is all about. And as I think about these texts and this message in perspective to how we celebrate the affirmation of baptism, I am reminded that faith is all about letting go. To embrace your baptism is to know you want to live a life that is reflective of God, not of this world. You want to live a life of reflective of what God has done, is doing, and will do in your life and in my life and in this great world. And even when you don't really know what that's all about, the invitation is still there. Today we celebrate our faith. And we celebrate that we are being nudged to speak into what we believe. And that nudge is coming from six amazing young men and women. Here's what I love about their faith statements. They're real. You'll hear a message that they don't have everything figured out. Some will articulate a faith that is still growing, and some will articulate a faith that has doubt and wonder. And in all of that is reflective of what God is doing in them. So as you grow in faith, as confirmands, will you find yourself frustrated with a God who is relentlessly loving? Will you find yourself changing how you see God? And how is that still being worked out? Are you going to experience a God who invites you into a life that is far different than what you've imagined? And for everyone else that has gathered, those questions are the same for us as well. See, that's the beauty of the affirmation of faith while we celebrate this day for these two and for the others yet to come today. We are all affirming our faith. We all are affirming how God is at work, how we wish we understood God better, how even we can be disappointed when God's love and mercy is relentless. The other day, I was sitting with Maggie on the couch and I said to her, I said, Maggie, I'm, I'm just so proud of how you articulated your faith. It just, it just warms my heart. I'm so proud of you. And she quietly said to me, I'm not going to be a pastor. And I said, what was that? And she said, I'm not going to be a pastor. And I said, well, could you say that louder? She said, no, I'm not saying it any louder because I don't want God to hear me say, I'm not going to be a pastor. See, Drew, aren't you glad you're not my daughter? Today we listen. We gather and we listen to God's word speak to us. God's word speaking to us through these texts. God's word speaking to us through our young people as they grow and develop in faith. We hear God's word speaking to us to let go. Let go of anything that is holding us back. Let go of anything that is restricting God from working in our lives. Let go of anything that limits God's potential in our life. Let go. And let God. Let God do everything else. And for that we say thanks be to God. Amen. As we transition to this part of the affirmation of baptism, dear friends, we rejoice that you to receive you as members of the Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church and into our fellowship in the gospel. 
At this time, we're going to hear not only Drew and Maggie's faith statements, but all of the faith statements from our confirmation students. Hi, my name is Maggie Becker, and this is my faith statement. When I think of my faith and what I believe, I often reflect on God's abundant love. God always shows how immense his love is in the Bible. One verse that sticks out to me is Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3, which says, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with unfailing kindness. To me, everlasting love means that the love will always be there no matter what. This love also includes God's never-ending grace and forgiveness. Knowing this helps me know that no matter what I do, God will always love me and forgive me for what I have done. Part of my faith is not only recognizing God's love for me, but also trying to show the same love and kindness to other people. One way I show love and kindness is through volunteering. I volunteer in elementary and middle school events, such as the middle school youth group and the Sunday children videos featured on Facebook. It's so fun to connect with the elementary and middle school students because I get to see and be a part of how they learn about God because it is important. Jesus once said, let the children come to me, which also shows us that everyone is welcome to learn about God no matter how old or young you are. Part of my faith is knowing that God welcomes everyone to know him because we are his children and nothing can separate us from him. As it says in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 and 39. I hope that I will continue to grow in God's love and kindness and that I can continue to know God's love even if and when I am faced with challenges and forget that I can trust and lean on him. Hello, my name is Jeffrey Grins, and this is my faith statement. Finding my faith has not been an easy journey, and I'm still not sure where I am. One passage that sticks out to me is the parable of the prodigal son, and I can really relate. I relate most to the middle of that parable because I feel like I am lost. The strength of my faith has fluctuated, and I really don't know where I am right now. Right now is a time in my life where I need to go off and do my own thing and gather my own information, and hopefully that brings me right back to the Father. In Luke, verse, in Luke 15, verse 13, it states, Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth and wild living. I believe that I am somewhere in between here and the son returning to his father. I am lost in my faith and unsure where to go. Even though I am lost, I know that the father loves me and he always will. After the studying I have done for confirmation, I shall continue to research and hopefully shall return to the father. May my faith never leave me entirely and allow me to one day walk alongside the father in heaven. As I grow older, my faith in you May my faith in you grow stronger and stronger and allow me to see all the good deeds you have done and appreciate the work you have accomplished, not only in me, but in everything you have touched. May the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit guide me and keep me walking on the path to everlasting life, even though my feet waver. Hi, I'm Natalie Hopkin, and this is my faith statement. What I admire most about the Christian faith is the commitment to selflessness and charity. Proverbs says, whoever oppresses a poor man insults his maker, but he who is generous to the needy honors him. Whoever closes his ear to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. Throughout history, this message has inspired Christians to play pivotal roles in many movements for equality. In Matthew 5.42 it reads, give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. Empathy for the marginalized is ingrained in the Bible and still just as necessary thousands of years later. As Corinthians says, let no one seek his own good, but the good of his neighbor. These words have motivated me to reflect on my own intentions and aspirations. How can I be more giving in my relationships with my, fr with my friends, family, and even strangers? Throughout my life, no matter what I do, I want to work at emulating the person these quotes depict. 
Hi, my name is Drew Hunt, and this is my faith statement. Who is God? God is the creator of all things, but he is way more than just that. He is the beginning and the end, and the Father. He teaches me right from wrong. He loves me unconditionally. He forgives me over and over again, and in the end, he is willing to sacrifice his own son for me. It is through faith that we receive the forgiveness of sins and life that is eternal. By believing that, he has freed us from the guilt, punishment, and power of sin. Faith is a gift worked in us by the power of the Holy Spirit. It doesn't come to us through anything we are capable of, but through what God does for us. We simply receive what is already being offered to us out of God's great love for us. Hi, my name is Quinto Odell, and this is my faith statement. Born to a church-going family, Sundays have always meant going to our saviors, but over time my perception of this time with God has changed. For the earlier years of my understanding, it meant going to Sunday school, then staying in the pew, singing songs, and running up for children's message, and down the aisle for children's chapel. This was the basis of my conception of church at the time. It was fun. As time progressed, I learned to deepen my interpretation of the stories of the Bible and my beliefs, instead of taking them at face value. A great example of this is parables. You read them, grasp the general story, and then expand what the story means by finding the underlying message and applying it to your own life. Take the parable of the Good Samaritan, for example. At first, it appears a story where a beaten tr Jewish traveler left on the side of the path was passed over by a priest and a Levite before a Samaritan goes by, treats his wounds, and takes care of him. Once you dig deeper into the meaning of this tale, however, there are multiple themes to this lesson. One being that it does not take the wrong act to sin, but refusing to do what is right. In disregarding the Jewish man, both the priest and the Levite sinned. Applying this to my own life teaches me that I should not only do good when it is convenient for me, but to seek it out and do my best to take advantage of opportunities to do good deeds. Taking things at face value isn't always beneficial, as demonstrated above, and much like this, blind faith should also be avoided at times. The best way to combat having blind faith is to listen to and express your doubts. If you are able to meet your doubts and overcome them, your faith will be stronger and more profound as a result. It's not a bad thing to have doubts about your beliefs and faith life. It's, in fact, it's great to convey any uncertainties to someone you feel will have the answers for you. Just a few confirmation sessions ago, I had a question for Pastor Jody. If Pontius Pilate claimed to have washed his hands of Jesus' crucifixion, then why is it that the Apostles' Creed contains a line suffered under Pontius Pilate when referring to Jesus? From that question stemmed a flow of knowledge from Pastor Joy that not only explained and helped me understand why, but also taught me quite a few things along the way. It isn't a bad thing to have doubts when it comes to God and Jesus, even the bigger ones, such as how do we know Jesus actually exists or existed? It's a good thing as it allows for you to voice your questions and create, a, a, create an extensive faith that makes sense to you. In closing, trust in the Lord and ask him to guide you through times of uncertainty. For in James 1.5 it says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. Hi everyone, my name is Adriana Corella, and this is my faith statement. A few months back, I questioned whether or not I should continue with the confirmation process. I wasn't sure I was ready to take this next step in my faith. After all, I didn't know everything about the Bible. I wasn't sure how I wanted to go forward in my life as a Christian, and most of all, I wasn't super confident in who I was as a Christian. Sure, I went and still go to a private Christian school, which instilled a solid, a solid foundation of knowledge of faith to me. I also consistently went to church minus COVID-19 times, and I was constantly surrounded by wonderful Christian peers, teachers, friends, and family, who all enabled me to see Christianity from many different perspectives. They expanded my very limited knowledge of my faith. Despite these things, I still neither felt super confident in who I was, nor did I know how I wanted to lead my life as a Christian. I felt a bit lost. As I pondered these thoughts a few weeks back, I went skiing in the mountains with my family. Throughout the day, I kept thinking of Psalm 121, or the Song of Ascents, specifically the beginning. It says, I lift my eyes up to the mountains. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. For me personally, I think part of the process of confirmation is accepting these unknowns. It's learning to be okay with not always having the answers. It's learning how I can not only trust God, but it's also about allowing him to be the foundation of which I direct my faith towards. I think it's totally okay not to have all the answers just yet. 
I think they will come to me as I grow. The latter part of Psalm 121 says, He will not let your foot slip. He who watches over you will not slumber. Indeed, he who watches over Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord watches over you. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun will not harm you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord will keep you from all harm. He will watch over your life. The Lord will watch over your coming and going both now and forevermore. Although I still feel uncertain, I think that's exactly what growing in faith is all about. Feeling uncertain doesn't mean I can't affirm what both my parents so lovingly gave me as a child, my baptism. I think taking this next step is pivotal when it comes to establishing a sense of personal confidence and surety in my life. As I go forward and affirm my faith today, I solidify my faith in Christ, knowing that he will guide me through my uncertainty. We invite the confirmation families to come forward. If Drew, if you want to stand here, and Maggie here, and your families can surround you as we have the rite of the affirmation of baptism. Brothers and sisters in Christ, in holy baptism, our Lord Jesus received you and made you members of his church. In community of God's people, you have learned from God's word his loving purpose for you and for all creation. You have been nourished at his table and called to be witness to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, therefore, I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church, the faith in which we baptize. Do you renounce all the forces of evil, the devil, and all his empty promises? If so, answer, I do. And just a word to the congregation, when you hear these questions, I invite you to answer as well. So let's just give them a chance. Do you renounce the devil and all the forces of evil? If so, answer, I do. Excellent. Do you believe in God the Father? God the, the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty creator, creator of, of heaven, heaven and, and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ his, his only Son, our Lord. Lord. He, he was, was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. Mary. He, he suffered under Pontius Pilate, Pilate was, was crucified, died, and was buried. He, he descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. You have made public profession of your faith. Do you intend to continue in the covenant God made with you in holy baptism, to live among God's faithful people, to hear his word and share in his supper, to proclaim the good news of God in Jesus Christ through word and deed, to serve all people following the example of our Lord Jesus, and to strive for justice and peace in all the earth. At this time, we have a blessing, and with COVID, we're going to ask your family to put their hands on you and Pastor Tom and I will not, but we'll extend an arm over you individually. So first we will go with Drew. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Drew the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm his faith, guide his life, empower him in his serving, give him patience and suffering, and bring him to everlasting life. Amen. And to Maggie, I'm going to touch my daughter. Father in heaven, for Jesus' sake, stir up in Maggie the gift of your Holy Spirit. Confirm her faith, guide her life, empower her in her serving, give her patience in suffering, and bring her to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, through the water and the Spirit, you have made these your own. 
You forgave them all their sins and brought them to newness of life. Continue to strengthen them with the Holy Spirit and daily increase in them your gifts of grace, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Congregation, I invite you to welcome these confirmands. Drew and, and, and Maggie, if you would maybe just step on the other side of your family so people can see you. And I invite you to welcome them with a round of applause. We continue our worship with a time of prayer. Please join your hearts with me. Oh, Father in heaven, we give you thanks for the great love that you have for all people, for the promise of your word that when we struggle, you hear our cries, Lord, and you listen to us, that out of your love, you use your power to help us in ways that we cannot fully understand, Lord, and we thank you for that goodness and the miracles that you daily work in our lives, those seen and those that we never even understand. We thank you, Lord, that we can have confidence to come to you because you did not spare your own son but gave him up for us. We know that you will hear our prayers. We know that in your love you will help us and strengthen us, comfort and heal us. So it's in this hope that we lift up to you our loved ones and those who are, need your healing power in their life, in their body, those who need the comfort of your spirit in their mind and in their soul. Father, today we pray for Roger Magnuson, for Nora Shippen, for J.T. Raymond, for Nancy Arneson, for Diane Hawkins' sister, Linda, for Tom and Francis Oline's granddaughter, Lizzie, for Fred Barnes, for Adam Watorek, for Sally and Phil Nygaard's son-in-law, Emmanuel, for Barb Sandberg, for Sandy Axon's sister, Jackie, for Lori Andreas, for Trina Arneson, for Jim Moen, for Sharon Geyer's daughter, Wendy, for Beth Peake's son-in-law, Joel, for Carl Hedin, for Dennis Pofall. We pray also for those who are grieving, for those whose losses are recent, and for those of us who grieve those who passed long ago. We pray that you would grant comfort and strength and peace in the midst of loss, and we pray especially today for my dad and my family as we mourn the death of my mother, Stephanie. Grant to all who grieve the assurance of salvation and the joyful promise of everlasting life through our Savior, Jesus. Lord, in your mercy. And Father, on this week when our nation inaugurated a new president, we pray your blessing on this transition of power we pray that you would bless our new president with wisdom and courage and strength to do what is right, even and especially when it's not popular. And we pray that you give us unity as a nation again. Heal the wounds that divide us. Give us a love for each other, that we listen to each other, that we understand that there can be peace and healing and reconciliation through your grace. Father, we also continue to lift up our nation and our world as we all struggle with this COVID virus and the many ways that it has affected our lives. For those who have been sick, for those who are grieving lives lost, for those who are gripped by the fear of this disease or the fear of spreading it, Father, we pray that soon there will be a time of refreshment, of healing, of a return to the normal ways of hugging and shaking hands and greeting one another. But until then, Lord, protect your people 
and humble our hearts that we call on you. Father, we offer these prayers and all the prayers of our hearts to you in the name of our Savior, Jesus. Amen. I invite you now to stand and join in the um, order of confession and forgiveness that's printed in your bulletin. One of the things we believe that as we affirm our faith in Jesus Christ and we rededicate him, ourselves to him, that we are also honest with him that none of us gets it perfect all the time. So I invite you to join in the confession. Trusting in Jesus Christ who came to share our humanity and bring light to this broken world, let us come before God without fear to make our confession. Comforting God, we confess before you in the presence of one another that we are sinners who fail to live as you desire. So often we place our trust in ourselves and not in you. We do not love each other as you have commanded. Because of us, your whole creation suffers. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, forgive us. In your boundless patience and mercy, lead us to live by faith in your promise. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for you, and for his sake, God forgives all your sins. Amen. I invite you to take out the uh, bread and the wine that you received on your way into church today as we hear our Lord's words. On the night our Lord Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. And after the supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, Take this and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And we pray together as our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. May the body and blood of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, strengthen you and keep you always in his grace. Amen. Let's join in singing together our sending song.
May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and grant you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Now go in peace, serve the Lord, and please exit out that way. There's power in the mighty name of Jesus.